The issue we're going to explore this evening is critical to the future of our country. In no uncertain words, racism is a sin. It is a form of human pride that God finds deplorable. The Bible teaches there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or, and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I love the way the message translation puts this. In Christ's family, there can be no division. I love it. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. We are all members of Christ's family. We need to bring healing to our land. To help us understand how to heal the racial divisions in our country, I'm proud to introduce to you tonight Dr. Carol M. Swain. And after I'm done introducing her, we're going to watch a brief video, and then she'll come up and speak. She's got a very impressive background. Dr. Swain received her BA from Roanoke College, MA from Virginia Polytech and State University, PhD from the University of Northern Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her MSL from Yale University. Dr. Swain is an award-winning political scientist, a former professor of political science and professor of law at Vanderbilt University, and a lifetime member of the James Madison Society, an international community of scholars affiliated with the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Before joining Vanderbilt in 1999, Dr. Swain was a tenured associate professor of politics and public policy at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Dr. Swain is passionate about empowering others to raise their voice in the public square. She is an author, public speaker, and political commentator. Dr. Swain is the author or editor of eight books. Her first book, Black Faces, Black Interests, The Representation of African Americans in Congress, won the Wood Woodrow Wilson Prize for the best book published in the U.S. on government politics or international affairs in 1994, and was cited by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy and by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in some of their decisions. In addition, Cambridge University Press nominated her book, The New White Nationalism in America, its challenges to integration for a Pulitzer Prize. Her latest co-authored book is Abduction, How Liberalism Steals the Hearts and Minds of Our Children. Dr. Swain's, and I want you to hold on for this, it's going to get long. Dr. Swain's pieces have been published in CNN Online, the Financial Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, and USA Today. She has appeared on ABC Headline News, BBC Radio, NPR, CNN, Fox News' Hannity's, Fox & Friends, Lou Dobbs Tonight, Judge Jeannie, uh, Jeanine, the PBS NewsHour, the Washington Journal, and ABC's Headline News. She has had a major role in that movie we saw last year, Hillary's America, The Secret History of the Democrat Party. And who's seen her Dennis Prager videos? She's had two of those Dennis Prager videos go viral. If you haven't seen them, Google Dr. Swain and, Dennis, and uh, Prager U. Dr. Swain has served on the Tennessee Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And she's a foundation member of the Virginia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Friends, I'm very proud to introduce to you tonight Dr. Carol M. Swain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I think it's important for people to know where you came from and for individuals uh, to not forget where they came from. And so um, that's why I wanted people to see that video and to also, you know, there's a backstory to every story, and that's where I came from. And I didn't know anyone that was a university professor. Um, my family was downwardly mo mobile. Uh, I learned, I've learned a lot about the maternal side of my uh, family, my grandmother's uh, uh, gr father and his father. They were Methodist, um, uh, uh, pastors and missionaries, and they were free blacks. And I only learned that a few months ago that they were free blacks. And um, but in, in any event, by the time it got to my family, 
and my mother, it was, um, you know, there's dire poverty on that side. And I was one of 12, and all of us dropped out of school after the eighth grade. And we dropped out because of the poverty. And uh, it's a kind of poverty that most people can't imagine. Like nowadays, we talk about poor, and it might mean that you have one car. Or maybe you don't have a TV in every bedroom. Uh, but, you know, in America today, even the poor people are pretty affluent by the standards of the rest of the world and by the standards that I lived under. But, you know, today in America, there's still some people that live in great poverty. Some of them are poor whites in Appalachia, and uh, some of them are racial and ethnic minorities in Mississippi and various states that are still living in poverty that you would not think would exist. And um, you hear sometimes a lot about affirmative action, and I will talk a little bit about affirmative action in connection with, with the book, uh, The New White Nationalism, that was published in 2002. But you can be so poor that affirmative action doesn't reach down to you. And um, like the people in my family, many of them are still in poverty, and they don't benefit from affirmative action. You can be so poor that it doesn't reach you. Uh, you have to be in the system to be able to take advantage of what, what uh, is left of it. And so that was, um, you know, that's the part of the reality uh, that I grew up in. And my family, I was not raised in a church-going family. And uh, my early teens, I, but I can say that probably my first experience with, with God happened when I was, um, I don't know, uh, maybe I was 12 or 13, I get all these years mixed up. I'm trying to write a memoir, and I get these years mixed up. All I know is that I was in this Easter program that my grandmother had put together, and there's actually a church that uh, that my grandfather was connected to, and and we were in that program, and I had a poem to recite, and I recited my poem, and the sun came down and shone on me in such a way that I knew at that second there was a God, and then, and I felt like I wanted to serve him, and I came off the stage and I told the people that I wanted to get baptized, but I didn't end up getting baptized. And uh, I started studying with Jehovah's Witnesses, and, um, and so that was, was a part of my story. But by the time I was 20, uh, I was doing the suicide gestures. I met the medical doctor who uh, I recently reacquainted myself with. I contacted him and found out that he was 25. When I was 20, he was, a, he was an intern and a resident, and he remembered me, and he said he always wondered what happened to me. And he's not on the internet. He doesn't have an email. <laughs> and, uh, and so we planned to meet. Uh, he's in Ohio. And, um, but he didn't know that he had changed my life. Uh, because when I had the conversation with him, he reminded me of something I had forgotten. And what I had forgotten was that there was a time in my life when I was smart. And as a, uh, as a young child, despite the poverty and missing lots of school, I remember one year we missed 80 of 180 days. Do you know what happens when you miss 80 of 180 days? Any teachers? Yeah, you fail. And, uh, and I, had, I remember experiences of coming in to school and having a teacher say, oh, look, look who decided to stop by today. Oh, we have a visitor today. And all of those things that some of you teachers may say to people when they don't come to school. Uh, and I can also remember uh, a case in particular where one of the students laughed and the teacher said, what are you laughing at? Uh, uh, she may not come to school, but she knows more than you do, and you're here every day. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was kind of great for my confidence. But until the doctor, you know, told me I was intelligent, I was attractive, I had forgotten that there was a time when I was smart. And, uh, and I don't think anyone had ever told me that I was attractive, and that sort of stunned me. And uh, in, in this early 20s, I mean, I guess I was 19 or 20 because my, um, I learned about the high school equivalency, but you couldn't take it until you were 20 and you had to wait until your high school class graduated. That was the law in Virginia. 
And so I actually had to wait uh, to take the test, but I took the test. And, um, and you know, it's, I don't want to get too far into my testimony, but I can tell you that I've always believed in the, the American dream. And uh, I thought I lived in the greatest country in the world. And some of the things that are taking place today, you know, it really saddens me that America is not the country that I thought she was. But I mean, I believed in America and I want to believe in America again. And I think that um, certainly the people, the older generation know, like when Donald Trump said, make America great again, that he, I don't think he was talking about racism. He was talking about that sense of pride that we had in being Americans and, you know, the patriotism. Like, we really thought we were the greatest country in the world, and a lot of us didn't know what the CIA was doing <laughs> and what, you know, all of these agencies of government. I think they've always been corrupt, but most of us didn't know what they were doing. And so we thought we uh, lived in a, a great country. And there were Judeo-Christian values. And I can tell you that the people who encouraged me to go um, to college and who made me feel that I could do anything, it turned out that they were white. And because I was poor and black, the middle class teachers, they didn't take an interest in the poor kids. I mean, they were all focused on the teacher's kids, the other middle class people's kids. And so people like me that came from poverty, we kind of like fell through the cracks. But the mentors that I had once I started the community college and then the people that pushed me to further my education, and uh, you know, they tended, they, they were white, they were more conservative. And, uh, and for some reason, God wired me in a way that I actually could not see my handicap. I could not see any handicaps when I was going through school. And it was only when I got in graduate school that I learned that I was, I was black, I was poor, I was a woman, and I couldn't do any of those things I had already done. <laughs> I really think that if I heard the messages that we give our young people today, especially the minorities about it's so racist, it doesn't matter what you do, everything is stacked against you, every police officer wants to shoot you, I just don't know, you know, if I had internalized those messages, if I'd heard those messages, I'm not sure what the story would be, but I didn't hear those messages. And so uh, I was spared from that part of, of uh, my experience. And so um, continuing with the backstory, I was steered, never sought to get a PhD. My first degree was in business at a community college. I thought I'd be a store manager. When I applied for jobs, I was told that I needed a four-year degree. And I kept filling out, you know, the job applications. And they had places on the job application, you know, for awards and accolades and all of these things that I had made the dean's list a couple of times. But I thought, okay, I need a good job. I need to put something in those spots. And so I decided that I had to get a four-year degree. And I went through the college catalog, and I looked for the field that had the least amount of math, and that was criminal justice, <laughs> which is an interdisciplinary field that includes political science. And so I knew that I would be good in anything that didn't have a whole lot of math. But like every college student, I had to take sciences, I had to take my maths, that I actually ended up taking as a senior. And I made a decision, and I want the students to listen very, very carefully. I made a decision that I was going to be an honest student uh, because I needed a job, and I wanted to have something to put in those places on the applications. And so I, um, at the time, I was working in a library. Again, you know, like this is my story. I was work. I started at the community college as a work study student, uh, probably working ten hours a week. The regular employees would call out, they wouldn't show up, and so I would work over whenever they had a crisis. The library director and staff created a full-time job for me, 40 hours a week, nights and weekends. And so when I was getting my bachelor's degree, I was um, working nights and weekends at the community college library in circulation. Do you know how many people use the library at night? <laughs> Not only could I do my homework, I could take my children to work. And how is that for God knowing me before I knew God? And, um, and so 
I um, checked out books and purchased books on how to make A's in college, how to take essay exams. And if students, if you don't know this, there are books out there that tell you how to take essay exams, how to do objective tests, uh, you know, how to do these things. And I applied those principles. And you know, my first semester at the four-year college, I had a 3.7. And my advisor, who was a conservative Republican, I remember that he told me in our first meeting not to expect to do as well as I'd done in the past. <laughs> that was like throwing the gauntlet down. <laughs> and, um, and I'd been told by other students that he was a racist and not to take his classes. And I'm telling you, I've always been wired. I'm weird. And I've never fit anywhere. And I said that in my last talk today, and a lady came up and she really, we were, we were sisters because she never fit anywhere. But I signed, whenever someone would tell me a professor was a racist and to stay away from them, I always signed up for their classes because I was going to show them. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that professor, um, and so the first, uh, my first uh, quarter or, or semester at that college, I had a 3.7 average. But in his class, he gave me a B plus and he said, you almost made an A. And I knew in my heart that I did make an A. He just wasn't going to give it to me the first time around. And, uh, and we ended up you know, becoming uh, close friends. But he told me um, at some point, th th you are a Republican. It, it, it was probably at least 15, I can't know how many years, but it was long, long, many years later that I actually became a Republican, but he said that I was. But it was just my views were different. And, um, but, you know, that was part of my story as a student. I had role models, but they did not look like me. And I do believe that if I'd heard the messages that we send young people today, I don't know that I would have tried as hard. And I also, you know, learned along the way that you know God was always involved in my life. Even as a child, he was opening doors, he was closing doors, he was protecting me from all sorts of things because I've been the most naive person in America. I mean, I may have met someone like Jeffrey Dahmer and they just had mercy on me because I was just so naive. They just had sympathy. I mean, you, you can't believe how the chances I took in my young adulthood when I started doing my dissertation research. And, um, but God was so much involved in my life, but I did not become a devout believer until 1999. And, uh, and there's a backstory on how that happened. But um, so I've been a devout believer, you know, 18, 19 years. But when I did have my conversion experience, it was very dramatic. And the Lord removed a lifelong fear of public speaking. And I, I used to be so shy as a child that I would literally forget how to speak. And I would want something, I would need something, and I would freeze up and I could not remember how to formulate words. And then when I was in college, students, you know that class participation is part of the grade, and it doesn't just mean showing up. You gotta say something, gotta do something. And so I knew that I had to do something. <laughs> I would write out either a question, or a comment, and then I would read it. And the paper would be shaking, and my voice would be quivering. And uh, that's how I got my class participation grade. I forced myself to read uh, the question that I had written. And it sounded like a, a reading a question that had been written, or making the comment just for the grade. And then as a professor at Princeton, that's where I started my career, which shows you God has a sense of humor. Imagine taking someone from the poverty you saw and starting them off at Princeton. And so that was, uh, and by the time I was uh, on the job market, I was known across the country. Uh, I mean, I was a hot shot. And I ended up with a signing bonus. And how did that happen? I always mentored well. Young people listening? I mentored well, which meant that when I saw someone doing the job that I, at that time I was in the track to become a professor that I was going to do, Whatever they told me I need to do to be successful, I did. And so in political science, they say you have to write papers, you have to go to conferences, you know, you have to come up with ideas. Whatever they said I needed to do, that's what I did. And so I was given conference papers as a student, 
by the time I was on the job market, I was known across the country. I had my own short list of schools, and I got a $25,000 signing bonus. That doesn't sound like a lot of money today, but back in 1989, that was a lot of money. And when I took my first job, um, the um, tenure track position at Princeton, um, well, I mean, that was the most money I had ever earned. But up until that time, I had one year while, while, one year while I was visiting at Duke that I earned uh, uh, 30000 But up until then, if you look at my Social Security earning statements, you know, it's just pitiful. Uh, but that was, you know, part of my experience, part of my story. And so I started my career at Princeton just full of confidence. I, it never crossed my mind I wasn't going to get tenure. Uh, and I knew that I was going to get it early. In fact, I announced when they hired me that I was going to do it in three years. And, uh, and I shared with the other group, <laughs> I knew I could do it in three years because John DiULio, the guy that was the head of my search committee, he had done it in one year. And he came from a blue collar family. And I figured that if John could do it in three years, I could do it in one. Now, where I, if he did it in one year, I could do it in three. And so I went up in the third year. I got it in the fourth year. And it was all, most of what drove me was I was going to prove to people this. I was going to prove that. And it was all about proving stuff. And uh, my success, all of those prizes, it gave me no satisfaction uh, because a lot of times I had already anticipated the prize. I, was, I had set myself up for disappointment because the only thing could happen is either I'd get it or I wouldn't and if I didn't get it I would have been disappointed uh, and so um, it was just a relief and you know it's, it's a terrible way to to live your life if you just you know if your identity is just caught up in your, your job or you know recognition I was very very miserable but I got my early um, tenure and then God set in motion the circumstances that sent me on this spiritual quest that took me through New Age and Eastern religions and all around the circle uh, before having a Christian conversion experience. But when I had that Christian conversion experience, the Lord removed my fear of public speaking. And it was like gone almost overnight because he impressed on me that he had given me a message bigger than me. And if I focused on the message, and the fact that I only had to please him, I could deliver it. And all of a sudden, I wasn't worried about, I might make a mistake, and someone might laugh at me, or what will these people think? Uh, it relieved me from that burden. And so this book, The New White Nationalism in America, It's Challenged Integration, that was the first book I wrote after I had my conversion experience. And I started it while I was in, at Yale. And I became a devout believer between the time I accepted my job at um, Vanderbilt and before I actually showed up. And so I accepted that job in 1998. I negotiated my sabbatical up front and went to Yale to get another degree in, in law because I thought maybe I wanted to be a lawyer. But it was a one-year program, and while I was there, I became a devout believer. And um, so I showed up as a very different person than the person that Vanderbilt hired. And, <laughs> Yeah, they hired one person, a different one showed up. <laughs> God has had a lot of fun with my life. <laughs> and, you know, he does have a sense of humor because, I mean, again, think about the poverty that you saw depicted in that Coral Ridge video. And, um, and that person starting at Princeton. And so it means that I'm with the most affluent of the affluent. And, um, and so it's not just knowing my subject matter, but it's also trying to learn the etiquette, you know, of, of all of these things. I mean, it, it, was, it was just, you know, like, I don't know why God did it that way, but that's what happened. And, um, and then with uh, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, they got more than they bargained for. And so when I, I'm, what times I've been critical, I have to realize that neither one of us knew what we were getting. And for myself, when this book was uh, published, it was published in 2002, I physically moved to Nashville in 2000 because that was when my job started, uh, I guess my job started the um, fall of 2000, so that's when I moved there. Uh, but I came as a devout believer, and I thought 
that once this book was published that the Lord was going to move me out of academia and I was going to um, move more towards the ministry. Have any of you ever heard of this lady named Joyce Myers? Okay, well, I thought that I was going to be the next Joyce Myers. And I was going to be traveling all around the world, you know, just talking and, and, you know, sharing stuff, you know, related to the Lord. And so I thought, okay, as soon as I finish this book, the Lord's going to release me from academia. And so I was so bold in this book. I talked about homosexuality. I talked about uh, all the policy issues. I solved all of America's problems in this book. And that's why it's so fat. <laughs> and, and guess what? God didn't do that. Um, he didn't move me out of academia. Uh, and if you have followed the events of the last two or three years of my career that has really boosted me to make me visible, uh, I don't know if it was God, you know, like the eagle when he, he pulls out the padding. Because being a tenured professor is a pretty comfortable kind of position, right? And so I don't know that I would have had the courage to leave if things didn't sort of go sour. And uh, things started changing. Uh, and eventually I took early retirement. And so you're looking at a retired lady here. I took early retirement as of August uh, 20, uh, of uh, August this year. And, um, and I felt, you know, that I was released to do that. But I also very much feel like the Lord said the world is your classroom and that part of this retirement gives me the flexibility to go around. You know, I've been speaking for Young America's Foundation. I've been going many places uh, to share a message that, that I believe that God has given me. I believe that he uniquely credentialed me uh, and that I have been called for such a time as this. And so with that as your background, I'll talk about race relations because uh, this book, published in 2002, predicted the rise of the alt-right. And if anyone saw the interview that I had with Judge Janine right after the Charlottesville, she started that interview off by saying, Professor Swain, you prophesied 15 years ago about this. And this book was a warning, and it talked about uh, the rise of a new kind of nationalism that was not the KKK or the neo-Nazis, something that I thought would spray it. And uh, that was one of the reasons why I felt like it was so important for me to get over my shyness. And that was when I started doing the media interviews. And that's how it all got started. But um, as far as race relations, things are as bad as you can imagine. And um, it's not been good for some years. And if you look at the public, um, in 2014, uh, the survey, the Gallup asked people if they worried about race relations. Uh, at that time, only 17% of Americans told Gallup they worried about Americans. By March of this year, it was 42%. Now, March of this year, that was before Charlottesville. Can you imagine what the numbers might be now? And when it comes to satisfaction with race, uh, in 2014, uh, 50, let's see, yeah, 55 percent of Americans were satisfied, you know, with race re relations. Um, today, in January 2017, it was 17 percent. And if you, um, there's been a steep decline in the percentage of Americans who will say that race relations are good. And when it comes to patriotism, uh, the number of people who are proud to be Americans, that number has declined quite a bit. And so. We're ashamed of ourselves uh, as being Americans. Uh, we're not getting along when it comes to race relations. And you can see um, just how it, you know, it's, it, was, it was moving in the wrong direction and just all the things that have happened you know, since uh, President Trump's election in 2016. And this is not about President Trump. And so part of, when I t part about, part of what I'm going to say tonight when I talk about um, the new white nationalism, is that most people get it wrong. Like, um, I would say that many people on the political left, and just not just the political left, that many people are painting with a broad brush. And so they are labeling you know, anyone who's conservative, anyone who disagrees with them, anyone who may have voted for Donald Trump 
as a white supremacist, and it's much more complicated than that. And when I wrote uh, the book, The New White Nationalism in America, I called it the new white nationalism to distinguish it from uh, the old style white supremacy, the neo-Nazis and some of the uh, more extreme groups uh, of that era. And what I drew attention to were seven conditions that I thought were converging to create a devil's brew for racial and ethnic uh, unrest. And I'm gonna uh, read to you at times from the book and also the conditions that I felt back in 2002 were creating a devil's brew for racial unrest. And any of these things individually might not amount to much, but then when you put them together, converging, then you get this devil's brew. And one is, was one of the conditions was the concerns that Americans had about immigration, legal and illegal, and how immigration was changing the demographics of the nation. And back then, uh, the estimates were, or the projections, were that by 2050, the country would be majority minority. That's going to happen before 2050. It may happen uh, before 2045, but it's going to happen before 2050. And by 2020, a majority of the children in public schools will be uh, a racial or ethnic minority. And then the white population itself is aging. And so one of the first uh, uh, issues I identified was the immigration, the demo demographic changes that were reshaping America. And back then, there were some, some uh, cities and states that were, that were becoming majority minority, and now they've already become majority minority. And even as that uh, trend continues, it's likely that minorities will be concentrated in maybe eight or nine states, and then the rest of the states will be majority white. But, and that has to do with just how people live. Uh, and during the time that I was looking at, um, uh, doing this research, uh, there was a demographer at the University of Michigan named William Frey, and he and this journalist named Jonathan Talov had pointed out that people were naturally resegregating based on race, and that the, the Americans were redistributing themselves. And so people that used to flee uh, racial and ethnic minorities by moving to the suburbs, they were moving to Iowa. They were moving to states that were majority white. They were moving to whole, you know, they're moving cross country. And then the racial and ethnic minorities, like Asians were, you know, moving to California. You know, Jews were moving, you know, where their group had a majority. Blacks were returning to the South. And so we were just naturally resegregating ourselves. And uh, that was a trend that uh, they thought were, was worth uh, reporting because it was a different kind of choice that people were making at the time. You know, people were not choosing to live among um, people of other races and ethnicities, and everyone was doing it. And so, you know, the whole story about racism and all of this, I mean, it's not just a white story. I mean, it's a story maybe about human nature. You know, maybe it's something about us that's tribal, but um, that was taking place. There were structural changes in the global economy that was causing uh, the loss of high wage production jobs. And so you had a lot of people that had low levels of education, whites, blacks, everyone, you know, that were working those jobs, they were losing jobs. And anyone here from North Carolina? Okay. Well, I mean, North Carolina is a state where they had a lot of um, uh, uh, textile plants and various kinds of plants. Uh, in Virginia had Mohawk r rubber. They had all these places where people could get a job they could raise a family, they could stay there. Well, those jobs, especially after NAFTA, you know, those jobs were gone. And so people were concerned about that. Uh, there was the white resentment and hostility over affirmative action. And part of what I didn't tell you is that before I had my conversion experience, I was writing a book on affirmative action, and it was called When Whites and Blacks Agree. And the story that I was telling in my book was that if you gave people concrete situations, vignettes, whites and blacks would always agree on what was fair, even if it applied to someone of a different race. And I had survey data where you randomly um, uh, randomized the race or the gender or the social class 
of the person in the vignette, and whites and blacks would always pick the same person, usually the underdog, which meant sometimes the majority of blacks would choose the white underdog, and a majority of whites would choose the black underdog. And so I had this positive story that I uh, thought I would be telling about uh, race relations, but then some things started happening uh, in the late 1990s that um, made that story less important, and some of it had to do with high-profile crimes that involved interracial violence. And so it's a long story how that research got folded into this book on uh, white nationalism. But the affirmative action, always been a grievance, and, uh, not, and has not been as accepted among you know, blacks as you might think. Uh, and it's never worked the way many people thought it worked. You know, like, I've seen it up close, and it doesn't work the way people think it works. Uh, there was concern about, there was concern about high black on white crime. So I, I've given you immigration, structural changes in the global economy affecting high wage production jobs, white resentment and hostility over affirmative action, uh, concerns about high black on white violent crime rates, uh, the growing push and acceptance of multiculturalism and identity politics. And you might ask, well, how does that fit in? It fit in because on the college campuses, there was so much focus on the uh, ethnic studies and uh, the multiculturalism and you know the ethnic pride that that was, uh, I say in the book, and I'll read to you uh, parts of the book, how that was fueling white identity. And white people were starting, the young people were starting to think in terms of, okay, if everyone else can celebrate you know, their unique background and their heritage, then what about us? And so everyone wanted a hyphenated identity. And so, you know, you could be African American or you could be Latino. Well, there were some whites that wanted to be European Americans or, or whatever. They wanted the hyphenated identities too. That was taking place. And I saw that the language of multiculturalism and identity politics was providing the justification for white identity and white uh, interests. And I say, I say in this book that that would be the next stage of identity politics in America because uh, there were people that were very upset about racial double standards. And that was like a grievance. And the people that I call the new white nationalists, they call themselves now the alt-right, but they, were, they didn't just happen. You know, they may call themselves the alt-right, they have rebranded themselves, but these were people who were well-educated. Uh, many of them have college degrees, Ivy League degrees, and they were using that language to make a case for white people to organize for white self-interest. And, um, and so that's why I call them the new white nationalists because they were using ideas, uh, social science data, FBI statistics, science. They were making an intellectual case for white people to do as racial and ethnic minorities had done. And uh, one of the persons that I had interviewed, like for part of this um, book, I commissioned interviews. And this started while I was at Princeton and uh, it was completed at Vanderbilt, but I commissioned interviews of people that I thought represented the spectrum of the white leadership that I would call white nationalists. And let me read you the backgrounds. And I had a white interviewer who was a Princeton preceptor, middle-aged Italian, uh, uh, who had a doctorate. Uh, the one that I found most fascinating, his name is Jared Taylor. He was the editor of American Renaissance uh, Magazine, which is an online magazine, and, um, and also the founder of the New Century. Um, I think it's called the New Century Foundation. But what I noticed was that the new organizations that these people were affiliated with, there was nothing in their name that would identify that they were uh, anything about white advocacy. They had names that sounded quite innocent, like American Renaissance, New Century Foundation. And Jared Taylor fascinated me because he was the child of Christian missionaries, and uh, he had been raised in Japan. And um, a lot of his family, I've learned, are evangelicals. And, um, but he has a bachelor's degree from Yale and a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Perfect gentleman, 
someone that I would never imagine using racial epithets, and he put forth a very intellectual case about uh, racial double standards and, and uh, using a lot of history, using a lot of science to make his case, and I knew that someone like that could be persuasive. Um, another person was Reno Wolf, director of the National Association for the Advancement of White People. Uh, <laughs> I mean, David Duke started it back in the 1970s, I think, when he was in college. And he started it in reaction to the National Association for the Advancement of White People. And let me read a quote from Reno Wolf. And in the interview, you know, he seemed like a very nice person. Now, I didn't meet any of these people. Uh, and we got informed consent from them. In fact, they signed three releases. And would you believe not a single one of them asked uh, my interviewer, who are you working with? He told them that he was working with a Princeton professor. They never asked, and one of the interviewees was William Pierce, who wrote the Turner Diaries and um, some other books, and he started the National Alliance. He had a policy of not giving interviews to blacks and Jews, and, um, and he was possibly quite dangerous. He died within a couple of months of the, the book being published. How unfortunate. <laughs> Um, he was the only one that I was actually afraid of. When you turn down a lot of pages, that may not always be a good idea. I'll find the Reno Wolf quote later. Uh, so Reno Wolf, working class kind of guy, directing this organization. Michael Levin, professor of philosophy at the City University of New York, he Jewish, a white nationalist. Um, David Duke, I mean, how can you do a book on white nationalism without including David Duke? He was one of the interviewees. Um, a guy named Don Black, who started an organization named Stormfront, and Don Black sent his son Dylan, who was active in that movement as a teen, he made the mistake of sending him off to college. And do you know what happened? <laughs> he got converted. <laughs> he renounced the racism. He became, uh, he, announced, he renounced everything. He actually, um, um, I mean, I mean, I mean it, was, it had a happy ending. He was embarrassed, he was ashamed, he renounced his father, he renounced everything. Now that's not good if you're sending your Christian child off to college and your child renounces everything, you know, because of what he gets. But um, Dylan is not part of the uh, white nationalist movement anymore. Michael Hart, another Jewish uh, professor, both of them had PhDs. Uh, he was a retired astrophysicist with a PhD from Princeton, he developed a plan for petitioning off the U.S. into diff different states. He would argue that, you know, blacks already behave as a separate nation and that we would all get along better if you had a black state, a Jewish state, um, a multiracial state, uh, you know, a Hispanic state. Uh, and, you know, he's serious. I mean, he had a plan for dividing off the U.S. And before you laugh too hard, uh, um, some of the black nationalists have talked about creating a separate black nation within the United States. And there have been meetings between Klansmen and members of black separatist groups. And so they actually uh, uh, agree on a lot of things. And so it's not, you know, just, just about white nationalists. Uh, there's a lot of agreement among people who are separatists, who are racial separatists. Uh, this guy, D Dan Gaiman, pastor of a Missouri-based Church of Israel. He was the leading advocate of the Christian identity movement. Anyone heard of Christian identity? Okay. What do you know about it? Well, I mean, part of, uh, part of it is that Adam was the first white man and that uh, Cain took his wife from some of the other sub-races, and so Jews and people of color would be sub-races. 
Well, um, and you know, so I mean, this person was interviewed. Matthew Hale, the leader of the World Church of the Creator. We had one woman, she called herself Lisa Turner. We don't know if that was her real name or if she picked that name because of the Turner Diaries. And, um, and then William Pierce, uh, he was the head of a neo-Nazi organization, the National Alliance, author of the Turner Diaries, which the FBI called the Bible of the Racist Right. And so I interviewed those individuals because I was curious about what causes someone to hate another person to the point that they'd want to take their lives. And, uh, and I became interested in that because there were some high profile crimes that took place during this era. And uh, one involved a young man that was a college student named Benjamin um, Nathaniel Smith, and he, who was raised in a middle class family, uh, or upper class, his mother was a realtor, his father was a physician, he went to a, a top high school in the Chicago area. He had a Korean girlfriend while he, while he was in college. He had Jewish uh, uh, friends. He went on a shooting spree, and he shot nine people, and he killed two. And one of the persons killed was Ricky Birdsong, who was a black coach of, uh, of, um, at Northwestern University at the time. And, uh, and when he started shooting people, he targeted uh, blacks and Asians and people like that. And people, when they tried to figure out, okay, what went wrong in this young man's life, he was upset about foreign aid uh, going to people from other countries. And then um, the two Jewish people that we interviewed with the PhDs, they were upset, probably one because he was at City University and the other one, I think he taught at a community college, they were all upset about affirmative action. And so with the interviews, my uh, interviewer, you know, just started off asking them where they grew up and, and then he would get to the point of which policies do you like or dislike. And so people just chatted and that was controversial that first that we interviewed them or that I, I interviewed them because people would argue that they don't deserve to be heard, that it was given a platform to people who shouldn't be heard. and. Um, and so that um, was something that um, affected how the book was received. Uh, there were people that didn't review the book or didn't want to review the book because they didn't believe that those people deserved to be heard. And as I say in the book, I believe that what you don't know can hurt you. And that, uh, that we needed to know what was taking place. And more seriously, I saw how, the, how there were policy issues Many of them were legitimate issues that were not being addressed by mainstream politicians. If you go back and look at the debates of 2000 and 2004, uh, immigration, I don't think it came up at all in 2000. And in 2004, it was mentioned twice, but it was not on the horizon of the politicians. They were both political parties avoiding it, even though the surveys showed that the American people cared a lot about it and they were being affected by it in adverse ways. And when, um, by 2006, you know, it was something that was a big public discussion in 2006. And in 2007, there was a bill that did not pass. We have not passed the immigration bill since 1986. And, um, but with immigration, what led politicians to finally get involved was the rise of the Minutemen and women. Do you all remember them? These were, people like grandmas and grandpas in lawn chairs uh, calling themselves patrolling the border. You know, they were sitting out there, you know, calling the uh, border patrol when they saw people. That was very dangerous. And so then the government had to get involved. But up until that time, the government was quite content to sort of ignore what was taking place. I want to read a quote to you from <clears throat> this guy, Don Black. He was the founder of Stormfront, and that is one of the more extreme. I would not put this person among the alt-right, um, but this is how he described himself. He said, I think the term white supremacist is an inaccurate description of most of the people that are part of our movement, because white supremacy implies a system such as we had throughout most of the 50s and 60s 
in which there was legally enforced segregation and in which whites were in a position of domination. We did have a supremacist type government in most states, but today the people who are attracted to the white nationalist movement want separation. We are separatists. We believe that we as white people, as European Americans, have the right to pursue, the desti to pursue our destiny without interference from other races. We believe segregation certainly didn't work and that the only long-term solution to racial conflict is separation. And then um, with Michael Hart, he argued that um, a multiracial state turns all of us and it hurts whites in particular. Whites, he says, have to put up with higher crime rates because of the presence in America of large numbers of non-whites. And so he's the Jewish uh, uh, professor that wanted to petition the U.S. South. Reno Wolf, this quote, and you know, he's a blue collar kind of guy, head of the National Association of White People. The National Association for the Advancement of White People was set up to get us back to the point where everyone is seen as created equal, where everyone has equal opportunity, and where everybody is judged under the same guidelines and the same set of standards. The uh, National Association for White People does not wish to convey the idea that we are a white supremacist type of organization or that we want to advance beyond other groups. We want to return to the ideal in which racially based politics of affirmative action and special privileges and special programs of any kind which are given to anybody, no matter what their race, are viewed as contrary to the best interests of race relations in America. And so again, he's talking to a white interviewer. They don't know that a black woman commissioned the interviews. And when I talked about the new white nationalists that, that are calling themselves today the alt-right, and I would say they're repackaged, you know, there's, there's a new spin. Some of, them are, some of them are separatists and some are not. Some of them are just people that are saying that white is like any other group, that if other groups have interest, then white people do too. Uh, I say in this chapter, uh, first white nationalists use the language of the civil rights movement to frame their demands for the abolition of racial preferences in employment and college admissions, and they use the language of multiculturalism to advocate wider acceptance of the notion of a distinct white identity, white interest, and white need for self-determination. In both cases, there appears to be a logic to their argument. Changing economic and demographic conditions uh, work to the advantage of white nationalists. As the white population shrinks, white Americans can be expected, this is me predicting, to behave more and more like other racial and ethnic groups. Given the human, given the human propensity for self-interested action, it is likely that whites will increasingly tend to frame their demands around a shared group identity and group consciousness. The change in economy, racial preferences for non-whites, the impending minority status of white Americans and minority emphasis on multiculturalism provide white nationalists with the language and grievances needed to make effective appeals about the need for whites to organize if they are to compete effectively with the demands of racial minorities. Now I'm skipping over to my conclusion. And this is a 15 book chapter. And again, it has 15 chapters because I was putting all my knowledge in it. And, um, and I thought it was going to be my last academic book. So concluding observations and policy recommendations. I say we in America, I believe, are increasingly at risk of large-scale racial conflict unprecedented in our nation's history, which is being driven by the simultaneous convergence of a host of powerful social forces. These forces include change in demographics, the continued existence of racial preference policies, the rising expectations of ethnic minorities, because a lot of minorities, uh, you know, they do have uh, the expectations of better income, better jobs, you know, better everything. So they have rising expectations. Uh, the continued existence of liberal immigration policies, 
growing concerns about job losses associated with globalization, the demands for multiculturalism, and the Internet's ability to enable like-minded individuals to identify each other and to share mutual concerns and strategies for impacting the political system. This combination of factors, in addition to others mentioned in Chapter 1, contributes to a social dynamic that can serve only to nourish white racial consciousness and white nationalism, the next logical stage for identity politics in America. There now exists an emerging white interest that is parallel with and structurally akin to a black and brown interest, which increasingly sees itself in need of protection from public and private initiatives that are said to favor minorities at the expense of more deserving whites. And so that's how I concluded this book back in 2002. It's not how I included it, concluded it, but that's how I start that chapter. And, um, and then the rest of the chapter, I have policy recommendations for America as a whole, and then uh, recommendations for the black community in particular. And part of the message of the book is, you know, that there was something out there that we needed to take steps or otherwise it was going to grow. And I saw the appeal that it would have for younger people because they're being educated in an environment where you're really pushing identity politics. And so everyone wants to have an identity. You see, everything is about identity politics. And so you could see that whites would also adopt that same mode. And so that was clearly taking place. And so part of my solution was that we needed to move away from so much identity politics towards the American national identity. Um, and as far as my ideas for imp improving American society, I felt that um, we needed to open up free speech and that we needed to allow the voices of people who have grievances, even if these people are white, that their voices needed to be heard. And to the extent that there were some legitimate public policy issues that were not being addressed, and some of the um, issues related to immigration, it's, it affects everyone. And it probably affects blacks, low-skilled whites, and legal Hispanics more than any other group. And so I was seeing, and I have a book on immigration. Immigration has not been a win-win for everyone. You see these studies where they say that immigration, you know, is so great for the economy, but then it always has that footnote, that little footnote that says only a tiny um, percentage of the population, you know, this may not apply to them. And that tiny percentage tends to be low-wage, low-skill Americans that have lost quite a bit. And if you did not have, you know, the surplus labor, you would have higher wages for low-skill jobs except now we have computers, and so I don't know, uh, uh, we have the robots. I don't know if any low-skill labor is gonna be needed soon. So we don't know how that's gonna turn out. But um, pretty much um, that's an overview of my book on white nationalism that was written 15 years ago. And some of the things that we see taking place on the college campuses, I think that uh, that's very dangerous, has to do you know, with the activism, Antifa, uh, I think with the Black Lives Matters that, uh, that a lot of that is being driven by people that are totally Marxist and everything is about race and I think that we have to be careful that we don't allow um, the racism, you know, that we know what's wrong and we're reaping the effects of the racism that goes back to slavery and I mean it's like it's an albatross around America. We ne never seem to get away from it but we have to come to the point, especially as Christians, where we do see each other as brothers and sisters. And so I think that on some college campuses, all sorts of things are taking, pl are taking place. Um, and a lot of it, I would say that there's almost like a reverse racism against people who are conservative, people who are Christian, and a lot of people you know, who are white. Uh, with all the talk about white supremacy and you know, the white race needs to be destroyed. And a lot of this is coming from white liberal professors that believe that how you bring about a better world is that you have to abolish any form of whiteness. Uh, that whiteness is evil, it's the root of all evil, and a lot of that's being spoken on college and university campuses, and when it comes to our Christian children that go off to college, there's a lot of shaming that takes place during orientation, and there's shaming about race, there's shaming that takes place about uh, being Christian, 
There's shaming that takes place about being conservative. And I think it's important that we stand up to it and that we cooperate. I mean, people are already standing up to it. Like David Horowitz has been at this for a long time, but there's the College Fix, uh, and this is an organization of conservatives where they have reporters on almost every campus, and these reporters record what's taking place in the classroom or the syllabi, and they report it. It gets national attention. Uh, the campus reform, uh, they have publicized a lot of things that have taken place against Christians, against uh, conservatives, uh, uh, or things that are taking place with regard to classes. I mean, just things that you would never think would be taking place in America. And what I have found on college campuses is that it's no longer anything about being a marketplace of ideas, that when they come in for orientation, they're being taught what to think, not how to think. And I think that on a lot of campuses, the conservative students are getting the better education if they survive, because they have to be so strategic. They have to know the arguments of the political left. They have to know what they believe. Either they will be won over or they will come out you know, much stronger because they have to navigate in those waters. What I find with uh, many of the liberal students on campus is that they, have, they come in as freshmen and they know everything. They've memorized the answer to all the great issues of the world. And they can go through some, if they take the right courses, all they have to do is regurgitate those answers. And for the conservative students, that's not the case. They really do have to be better. And, uh, and so, but everyone's getting shortchanged in the process. And I think that um, we have to be careful about where we spend our money. And uh, in Christian universities like this, if they're teaching a biblical worldview, I mean, it's a great foundation for your child, but your child may want to go to law school, and they may want to go to medical school or some other professional school. They'll be in that different environment, but hopefully they will be trained enough in worldviews and what they know that they will be able to survive what comes at them, but they have to be strategic. And, uh, and so it's about race, it's about uh, you know, class, it's about religion, especially when it comes to Christianity. And um, I'm not sure you know, how everything, I know how everything ends in the Bible, but I'm not sure how everything ends with American academia. But I do think it's important for us to be aware uh, of what's taking place. And, and so with that, I will stop and I'll take your questions. Well, thank you for coming and uh, for all the, that you're doing to help America. Um, I've already anticipated part of what you talked about because I've created my own victim class. Uh, my nickname is Pigment Challenged Pete. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I can cover both. Okay. <laughs> well, now but you can identify as anything, and that's very <laughs> dangerous because if all white people start identifying as minority, and, and apparently they're encouraging it, whatever you think you are today. Uh, and so that means you can check the box and affirmative action collapse if enough white people start checking the box. I don't think people have thought it through. <laughs> well, and, and I checked that box as a satirical statement on, on uh, the trends that are, that are going on in America. But what I find disturbing is that um, this alt-right, which I had no idea existed, so I appreciate that you wrote about it, well, it didn't just happen. It's been around a but, long time. But, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think that way. I, have, I don't know anybody that thinks that way. And so, but I get labeled that, being a white conservative. I get associated with... No, you with, probably get called a white supremacist. And I'm saying that the alt-right and the old-style white supremacists, that these are not exactly the same groups. And I think that the larger body of white people who may have voted for Donald Trump or may not have voted for Donald Trump, that's different, too. And I, I think you know you have you have whites that are into self hatred, you know you have whites that uh, just many different groups of whites. But I think that right now the media and a lot of people are using a broad brush to paint everyone as a white supremacist. 
uh, the white supremacists uh, that I think are dangerous, the ones that actually right. hate and want to kill. Um, you know, the, I, I, I would say that they are a tiny percentage of the population, but this alt-right, you know, these ones that are well-educated, that are actually growing, mm -hmm. you know, on college campuses, uh, those are people that are well-educated and they have grievances. They feel like they need to be organized. And I think that... Um, the way you would neutralize that is that you listen to people because the worst thing you can do, and I talk about this in my book, is to have a situation where like-minded people only talk to people who agree with them. The more people talk with other people who agree with them, the more extreme they become. Well, uh, so I'll get, I'll get the, my question in. Is how do you feel about, the I'll make a statement, that uh, it's my impression that the left in this country and the professors and universities are well invested in creating this divide and that that has the result of encouraging people like the alt right i mean they they it helps them and that it they created them they have more yeah. they call themselves the alt right which means alternative right but if you actually look at what they believe and how they were founded and how they operate they have more in common with the left because they're doing identity politics and so um that's, that's what. I but I mean, that's then that's Amer I mean America. This is America, and that's what they're doing, and it can be traced back to cultural Marxism. And for people that really want to understand what's taking place, there are some books you know that uh, I would recommend. I mean, there's some things that many of you may have read in high school, George Orwell's 1984, mm -hmm. uh, and you may have read it years ago. I always had my students in political culture read it because when you read it a second time, you read it today, it takes on, on a whole new meaning because you actually see that we are living through an Orwellian period of history, you know, with the media being taken over. And even with all these attacks uh, on males and females, like for y'all young women, I'm not sure how you're going to find husbands because I think a lot of men are going to be afraid to approach you. They shouldn't be approaching you on the job anyway. And so I think we're going to take place, take care of workplace harassment because I don't think people need to be, uh, you know, looking for their mates on the job. So if you're interested in someone, someone has to quit their job. Um, but, um, yes. First, thanks so much for, for coming. Um, you said a lot of things that, that are probably making a lot of people think. Um, the question that I have, I'm listening to everything you're saying about the alt-right and I'm listening to how it's a problem, but we're Christian, so we're called to see past that. How do evangelical Christians, how does the Christian community, how does the Christian church do a better job of making these things, making these movements, whether it's the alt-right or Antifa, because I think the two are pretty synonymous, um, how do we make it where they don't, their voice is not necessary? Because we're I doing don't know that better. that voice is necessary because they are part of the same movement. A, a lot of that is, is, is t I mean, I think that if we had a society, you know, just looking at the college campuses where you had real dialogue, where when speakers were brought in to speak, you had a panel, and on that panel was not people that all agreed with one another, that you had one or two people on a panel that may disagree and so they would thresh out you know their ideas the audience would listen and you know they would decide who won whether it was a debate or who won the discussion uh, but you would have people airing their differences I think that if you had that it would be better for young people I don't know that it's necessarily you know the greatest way uh, the greatest thing the way we do it now is that if you have conservative groups on campus they bring in their speaker and Whole, you know, maybe the room is filled with people who agree with that speaker and then the protesters who are drowning them out. Uh, that's not ideal. Uh, ideally, you'd want to bring in speakers and the whole campus or everyone would hear that speaker and then they would ask questions and those questions would get answered. I don't think the church owns racism. I think that racism is a bigger society, societal problem and, um, and that it's not just one group. I mean, you've heard the argument that black people can't be racist because to be racist, you have to have power. Have I mean, you heard that's that? That's ridiculous, but that's... Yeah. I, 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 I get what you're saying. I guess for me, 
I'm sitting here and I'm listening to what you're saying and, I, and I, I find a lot of value to what you're saying. But then I listen to the evangelicals that we hear and what their messaging is. And it's not what you're saying. I, I very They don't understand what I'm saying. I very rarely hear anyone <laughs> say what the first speaker had to say, which is racism is absolutely the antithesis of what Jesus came for. I very rarely hear that said. A lot of, a lot of what I hear and a uh -huh. lot of what the left is hearing, which is causing them to reject a lot of what we need them to hear about us, a lot of what they're hearing is placating. A lot of what they're hearing is justifying, well, yes, they did that and they said that and that's bad, but I'm going to be okay with that because they're going to vote or they're going to say what I need to support my conservative value. I was raised with conservative values. I served my country. I still serve my country. And I'm proud to do so, and I'm proud to be an American. At the same time, I'm a black woman in America, and I, and I recognize that there's a difference for me versus other people that I went to school with and I grew up with. And it's not about me owning that. I don't own that in much the same way you are. I'm, I'm ready to prove anybody wrong who thinks that I can't. But I recognize what I'm looking at, and what I'd like to be able to, to get to hear is, how do we, as a group of Christians, not black Christians, not white Christians, but Christians, why is our messaging not the same? But because I mean, because in way. some, I would say that in the Christian world, there are some Christians that are more into politics than they are into the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, it is the case that the last time I checked, you know, that God didn't have a political party, but I happen to believe that if he did have a political party, it wouldn't be the Democrats. <laughs> because, because I don't think that he would be in a party that would support, you know, abortion, that would support, uh, you know, the, the homosexuality, and there are just so many things that are unbiblical, and just the fact at that convention, they booed God, and they wanted to take out any references to God out of their um, their platform, and this was at the, uh, the convention before last. And so, you know, like, I think that, I don't believe that one particular group owns racism. I see a lot of racism, you know, within the black community and within the Democratic Party and within the liberal left. And a lot of the things that the liberal left, you know, that they have pushed for racial and ethnic minorities, it's not made anyone be, uh, better off, it's made people worse off. And when it comes to uh, welfare reform and what are you gonna do about people like my relatives that are mired in poverty, there has to be a new approach because what we've been doing over the last you know, 50 or 60 years, it has not worked. And uh, you know, there's a place for more creative, compassionate thinking. And when in my church, and I've been in black inner city churches, and I go to a Baptist church now that's predominantly white. I see working in the inner city in the projects, they're the older white people that are working in the projects. They are youth for Christ. You know, they are the ones that are working with teen challenge. And uh, I don't see many black people or the black churches working in those places with the poor. And I don't know what that's about. And I also know that, uh, and, so, and so part of it is like there's not one group that owns this. There's not one group that owns racism. And when the Baptists at that last convention, you know, they were, there was a floor fight and they ended up uh, putting out this uh, resolution condemning white supremacy and white nationalism. I think that that was a mistake. I think it was a mistake because the Baptists don't own white supremacy and white nationalism, that that is a problem for our country. It's not owned by one particular group. It's not owned by one particular group. And I felt like that what was taking place was very political and, um, and that, that it was inappropriate, you know, my understanding of what a church convention would be about, it would not be a place where you would be pushing those political social agendas. I mean, that's just my take on what should take place at a church convention. And so other people obviously feel differently. And so, I mean, I, I don't know what to say other than I think that we have a race problem and it's cutting many ways. And I think that uh, we're reaching a point where it's very, very dangerous. There's a lot of hatred taking place. You know, there are these knockout games where uh, young people will come and they find an elderly person, 
you know, and what, what we see is she uses some elderly white person and, you know, just knock them out out of hatred. And, uh, and then this narrative that's being fostered that white police officers, you know, they get up every morning wondering how they're going to shoot someone. You know, that's not healthy for our young people to believe that. But I think a lot of young minorities believe, you know, that the police are their enemies, that they're out to get them. I think that we all have a stake in trying to change that. Okay. Can we get Dr. Cash here?